Eleanor Powells is a public policy scholar with the Science and Technology Innovation Program at the Woodrow Wilson Center. She joins us today to talk about human genome editing. We're not talking about editing uh, words or editing video. We're talking about editing the human genome. So maybe we could begin by you talking about what is our cap ca uh, capacity in that regard currently? What are we actually capable of doing? Sure. So three years ago, a biochemist at Berkeley, Jennifer Dodna, helped help make one of the most monumental discoveries in biology. She helped design a much more precise, targeted way to alter the DNA in the nucleus of a cell, just as a, a computer program can edit a word in a document. Mm -hmm. So to give you an idea of how it works, researchers use a DNA cutting enzyme guided by a specific molecule that go to the site of the genome you want to target. And the system acts like molecular scissors, so cutting or knocking out the faulty gene and providing the correct gene to be pasted in during the cell's repair process. This technique can be done into the nucleus of different cells, adult cells, embryos, stem cells, and it works on mice and men. So I mean by this, wow. you know, it could be applied to virtually any organism or any kind of cell in our bodies. Now make these DNA manipulations to a one embryo cell, which is about to start replicating, and these changes can be sealed permanently into the germline, so they're passed, passed on. on, passed on to future generations. Which, so which is uh, huge as far as the difference between just uh, manipulating a single organism, now you're talking about potentially changing the nature of a species. Of, the, of our biological blueprint, literally. So it's a defining technology for the future of, uh, of humanity. The uh, benefits and risks is a big question, but if uh -huh. you could give us sort of the introduction to plot. Obviously, when people think in, of benefits in genetic manipulation, they often think of ending diseases or, or curing diseases. Risks, it, it, your imagination can run wild. Sure. What is your initial assessment of benefit risk in this area? Well, the benefits are going to be tremendous, and they're going to happen in our lifetime. So researchers in labs all over the world are already using genome editing, mm -hmm. but they hope to use it one day for what they call genome surgery. So replacing faulty genes in people, opening new possibilities for treating and eventually curing disease. So right now, uh, they are targeting single gene disorders, muscular dystrophy, cystic fibrosis, genetic disorders arising in blood cells, like sickle cell anemia, because in that case, you can actually remove uh, the patient blood cells, modify them in the lab, and then return the treated cells to the patient. But then another huge clinical development will be for cancer and for disease of the immune system. So researchers are currently uh, exploring how to edit the genome of our T cells, which are white blood, white blood cells that are really key in our immune system. Mm -hmm. And the idea would be to better fight blood cancer like leukemia or better resist HIV. And a company called Sangamo Biosciences is working really hard to soon start the HIV clinical trial. Another company, Editas Medicine, is doing experiment on eye cells to be able to eliminate a defective gene that causes uh, blindness in kids. So you see from 10, 15 years, our relationship with genetic disease is going to be very different from yeah, now. Not just healthcare altering, uh, reality altering as far as what's possible for human uh -huh. beings. The, uh, a recent article uh, about activity of scientists in China, this so-called, is CRISPR method, is that how you yeah. would say it? The, the, uh, the potentials of curing disease or the on the dark side enhancing beauty or intelligence are things that are, people are afraid to dabble in. One of the uh, articles uh, said that scientists were both excited and terrified uh -huh. about this. Excited and terrified. Well, first of all, there are still risks and uncertainties that they work on in the lab right now. One of the first problems is how to deliver the CRISPR machinery to a critical mass of human cells to have a therapeutic effect. The second problem is what they call the off-targets. So when the DNA is deleted by mistake, you can imagine what that means, right? Mm -hmm. So they need to really work on the precision of the edit editing process to be sure they don't make changes in the genome that could have negative health effects. And the experiment didn't work exactly as planned, right? Things went wrong. It didn't. So they modified the genome of about uh, 86 non-viable embryos and only 71 of these embryos survived the experiment and only a small fraction of those were actually successfully modified. So the success rate was really low. But this study fired a debate that still burns with a majority of leading biologists asking for a moratorium on doing research on human germline. And, about this uh, moratorium, Eleanor, what, what, are, what do we know as far as the, the possibilities there? We know that certain countries will sign on and agree to such a thing, mm -hmm. but then there are always outliers who will try things. I think of cloning, where there was pretty much agreement among scientists that you shouldn't try to clone, clone a human uh -huh. being and yet there were attempts to do so by others so what are the chances that any sort of moratorium or ban could actually be effective yes the question of you know is it going to be a if 
about human germline editing, no, it's going to be a when. It's going to happen, right? Mm -hmm. So uh, the question is actually how do, we, how do we shape an international debate that can lead to some results? If you look at the, uh, the map, a lot of countries in Europe are already refusing to do that kind of research. And they have the legislation and they are abiding by uh, uh, international agreement, the one of the Council of Europe, the one of UNESCO. In the US, major institutions like the White House and the NIH said they wouldn't fund that kind of research. So I don't think that would happen lightly uh, under federal authority, and especially if we don't have ethical and safety guidelines. But then you have the private sector. There is no legal prohibition in the private sector for doing such a research. So what companies or fertility clinics can do, that's a big thing. And create financial incentives. If you could come up with some major cure for a, a disease that has been plaguing humankind, there's great profit to be made. That's a huge question. I'm really interested and, and fascinated by, you know, how do we make new technologies affordable for different layers of society, for different people? Uh, and I think, you know, that's going to be a big question to solve and to think about. A lot of uh, cutting edge technologies and therapies are actually extremely expensive right now. And so we are increasing inequalities. You're describing a have and have not scenario, not something new, but certainly in this area that could really be devastating. It's not new and it could be devastating. Um, you know, it's also, we also need to shape the debate in a way that we can include different voices, voices of people at the margins, uh, people with different expectations and different, different value, values. Who, who, who's about leading the charge in that regard? Who is shaping the debate? Who are the voices out there that are shaping the debate? The debate is being shaped right now by scientists. Uh, and, you know, we are kind of facing a, a Zilomar momentum, uh, like we had in 1975. Um, the debate also gained some political salience because the U.S. Congress is actually looking into it. Uh, they invited, uh, you know, experts to testify. They are looking into the question of funding this kind of research. So we'll hear about it for the next coming months. The national academies will run uh, scientific research to give guidelines to clinicians and regulators. But I think what's missing is the voices of the public, you know, mm -hmm. you and me as citizens. And I think that's going to be one of the biggest challenge for our democracy is how do we integrate different public values, expectations, fears, ethical questions into this debate. It's difficult to, c to conduct a thoughtful uh, public debate or discussion on something specific like healthcare costs. Now you're talking about a huge philosophical question, essentially discussing the nature of what it means to be human and how far we should go with our human capabilities in in changing the formula at its most fundamental level. Mm -hmm. But it's just, it's the reason why, you know, it, I mean, this, the complexity of the debate makes it even more interesting. We yeah, cannot absolutely. decide about this without uh, hearing the voices of, uh, of people from different cultures and from different backgrounds. It, the, what we know now, the science now, and this whole, this comes down to almost the nature-nurture debate. How much of it what is. we are, who we are, is a function of that DNA that we can now uh -huh. manipulate, and or how much is a part of just the way we're brought up, how we're educated, all those different things. Mm -hmm. What what does science tell us right now in trying to resolve that conundrum, the nature nurture conundrum? Well, the science is not, does not know much, you know. So we have the impression we're we're on the edge of something new because the technological capabilities have developed tremendously, but we still don't know much about how the human genome evolves as we live. And that's something I'm really interested in. So, be, you know, beside genetics, you have also epigenetics, this field, this field of science that looks as how the genetic functioning of our cells evolve as we live. What's it called again? I missed the epigenetics. word. Epigenetics. Epigenetics. So the interactions between our environment and uh, our genetic mm -hmm. uh, chemistry, right? A final question is about, in, in this notion of the debate, I have in front of me a, a story you sh shared, you and a co-author did, a bit of a science fiction piece, uh -huh. looking at a future where we've already begun uh, ordering up our genetic makeup through manipulation. Uh, what role does science fiction in this type of uh, contribution make to the overall discussion. Do you see it as a significant part of how we begin to understand and move forward on these discussions? Yes, I think science fiction plays a really interesting role, actually. You know, they come, all these scenarios come from Hollywood, from TV shows, it's Gattaca, Orphan Black, Splice. And most of the time, these popular narratives um, are describing a society where we can engineer genetic differences that improve or, or limit who you can who you have a chance to become, right? So who's going to be a leader? Who's going to be a super soldier? Who's going to be a scientist? Who's going to make the most money? Who's going to go to the moon? And so in these scenarios, I think the question raised are really interesting because they, they come back to uh, how much inequalities are we creating in the wake of technological development? Uh, who is going to reap the benefits 
uh, of a technology, how much space do we keep for genetic diversity and human flourishing? And I think that's a really interesting question. Do we always want to meet the significant same? You know, that's kind of behind the love story in Gattaca. Mm -hmm. And it reflects reality because you now see dating websites matching people based on their, on their genetic traits, right. you know? So I think the biggest question is also, how will our personal and collective identity evolve in this age of genetic imperialism? And we need to be able to question what the scientific premises are, and we need to be able to discuss the ethical question collectively as a society. Uh, and, and I know it's, it's not fair to ask qu specific questions about timelines, but the types of revolutionary progress and changes we're talking about within our lifetime? Sure, because uh, some clinical trials will start from two years to five years. You know, mm -hmm. I mentioned the one on HIV. Um, so from two years to five years, you can start clinical trials. Then it will depend on how long it takes to actually approve the therapy or the drugs. Uh, that could take 10 years. But I, th I think from 10 to 15 year years, we could see like really interesting developments. Well, and then the, the far edge scenarios, you know, the sci-fi scenarios are for later, are. I guess. Lots of good movies and books uh, to come <laughs> from this as well sure. as actual science. Well, Eleanor, thank you. Fascinating stuff. Appreciate it. Thank you, you so us. much. Thank you, John.